Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is supported by the Minnesota Department of Commerce, Telecommunications, Access Minnesota, and Nisswa Tax Service. Nisswa Tax Service, tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Across from City Hall in Nisswa and online at nisswatax.com. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to Lakeland Currents, where tonight we are doing part two of our two-part series on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And if by chance you missed our show last week, I'd like to direct you to our website, and you're certainly welcome at your uh, leisure to go to that website and see what we covered on our first show, and that's at lptv.org. And what we did in our first show is define what fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is, uh, how it affects children. It's, it's estimated that 30% of the children in our public schools today have some part, a portion of this fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which is a tremendous challenge for our educators in our school districts. Uh, tonight, we're going to start the program with a lead-in that Annie Cook has done, looking at some of the symptoms of this disorder and how people are trying to teach students who have this. We do see FAS kids in the, in the school district. It's a reality for most schools throughout the country, the presence of students who suffer from some form of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And a team of people is needed to deal with their issues. It is a wide range of, you know, strategies that they have to use. They really do. Treatment varies from child to child, but there are some overarching principles. Use concrete terms, stay consistent, repeat information, develop a routine, keep it simple, be specific, maintain structure, and continue to supervise. One of the most important yet one of the most challenging factors about treating fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is starting early. Even if there's not a diagnosis, the child will benefit from getting into treatment before the age of six. The earlier the better. Um, it, it's an embarrassing thing sometimes for mom to say, yeah, I was using, but it could be the best thing you do for your child. An early start doesn't guarantee a child with FASD a life without trouble because much like the treatment strategies, results can also vary. Some kids will be able to develop well and to be able to have those kind of opportunities. Some kids are probably going to need to have supervision all of their life depend at the severe end. Children with FASD could fall behind developmentally, which experts say can become a stress on parents. You're going to have some expectations about how things should go with your children, especially if they have other children as well, and those expectations aren't going to be met. So this is going to be a new process. Probably the most important thing for parents with children with FAS is support. While FASD is a lifelong disorder, the services and support are out there to provide the continuous care needed for these individuals. For Lakeland News at 10, I'm Annie Cook. My guest this evening again is Jody Crow, who uh, spent the show with our, our last show with us rather, explaining the, the issues uh, related to this disorder. And this evening he's here to talk about the more violent side of the disorder. And he has written a book entitled The Fatal Link. And it's a, a book that covers the school sh some of the school shooters uh, in America. And his um, research has shown there's a direct link between the shooters and mothers who are drinking alcohol. Uh, welcome to the show again, Jody. Thank you. And I should say that Jody is an educator. He has been a classroom teacher. He's been a principal. He's been a superintendent. He has worked on uh, Native American uh, reservations for close to 20 years and has seen a lot of the issues of this syndrome uh, up front and close. But I want to point out again that this is not about reservations. Right. This is about the whole country. It's That's correct. Right. Uh, and right. this disorder happening across the world, really. Right. And I want to clarify one thing in, in the introduction. We talked about 30% of the kids. And it's, what, what it is is about 30% of the kids have been prenatally exposed at some level uh, the, the research is real clear that about 30% of mothers have drank alcohol prior to knowing because there's so many unwanted or unplanned pregnancies and they don't know they're pregnant until you know six weeks or, or better and 60% of women are drinking in Minnesota during their childbearing years and 50% of women are having unplanned or unwanted pregnancies. So that's where the 30% figure comes and, and, and any drink has the potential to take potential away from a child. So somewhere in that spectrum, we have a, a great number of kids. So in tonight, we were going to talk about 
you know, the, the violent aspect that I have witnessed and, and, and the reasons why that happens. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what you see with children that are somewhere on the spectrum uh, in the schools. And parents see this at home. Um, they'll see it in schools, in, mostly in the schools, because that's where the kids are at, and that's where you're starting to see that, starting at a very early age. Actually, you see, you see some of these, these behaviors happening with very, very young kids in early childhood where there's tantruming and, uh, and the tempers, they're having a hard time controlling their tempers and they have very poor emotional control. And uh, they have, they have, uh, they're very sensitive, sometimes very sensitive to light and, and, and sensitive to feel like they'll have a hard time with the, the uh, uh, tag on their collar. So things irritate them. And when they get irritated, then you know, they, they can't take it. So the, the explosions, the tantruming, the, the, um, the, the behaviors that you see that are, are uh, you, you think they look like a, a normal child, but something's wrong. They're not, they're not, uh, they're, their brain is not working right to, to handle all the sensory inputs that's coming into their brain. So um, those things are happening at young ages, but they really start to accelerate when they get into their, their uh, early adolescent because there's other things happening in their body. You know, the, um, you know, there's a couple other things that uh, when adults work with them, they're very concrete, as you saw earlier, and, and, and adults don't realize sometimes that they can't um, generalize what's said to them. Uh, for instance, if I were to say, uh, uh, Ray, why don't you leave the room and don't let the door hit you as you leave? Well, you understand what I'm talking about. You understand, you know, get going, you need to move. Well, a brain that is damaged can't generalize and understand that the language that way so you might have the kid get up and walk over to the door and, and literally turn around and shut the door really you know slowly so it doesn't hit them in the back as they leave because they're not generalizing that statement to and they're and they're very very being very concrete but we as as adults don't understand that so then we think that that behavior is a willful behavior that they're doing that just to get get at me but no in fact they're that's what's happening, and that's what their brain is telling them to do. So when, when, you, when adults see those behaviors, um, and they see the, the, the kid that is exploding because they, um, something has happened in, in the room and, and the kid explodes, then the adults who do not understand brain damage will then continue to think it's willful behavior and continue to go after that child in a way that then pushes that child even further down the road to um, to what's called secondary disabilities of fetal alcohol. Okay, go ahead. I was just going to say that uh, after our last show, we received quite a few emails, and one of the emails that I got was from parents whose child has grown up and left home, and this the problems are still there. Yes. They haven't gone away because someone graduated from high school. Those problems are for mm -hmm. life. Yes, yes. And that really hit home from some of the emails that I saw. Yeah, and. and we see a lot of this, and we get a lot of research from adoptive parents, parents who have adopted children who have prenatally, heavy prenatal exposure. And they may have already raised their own biological children and they adopt a child, and they're using the same parenting strategies with this child and it's not working. And they're seeing this just uh, totally abnormal behavior with this child. And for, for many years, they didn't know what it was. They called it something like adoptive syndrome or something like that. Uh, but what it really is is the brain damage that these kids are exhibiting, and the parents are trying to use the same strategies with their kids, or whatever strategy they can. And they're not, and up until recently, I mean, there was a, there was a um, person in town here, a um, very well-known person who's um, the, you know, a business person in town, he told me that for 16 years they had no um, help from the professional um, people that they were working with because they couldn't identify what was wrong. They had to go to North Dakota to find somebody who would identify that their child was fetal alcohol. And they've had just a, a litany of trouble. Um, but th until they realized you know, exactly what it was, they didn't know how to deal with it. And, he, and it still is brain damage in, in parents, especially adoptive parents who have already identified that their child is FAS and their child is moving on. They're terrified about having their child go out and live on their own. But these kids, they're turning 18 and they want to live on their own. 
when they get out and they have very hard time handling their money, they have a hard time with their, their emotions, uh, they, they have a hard time living on their own. And, and I'm talking, there's various levels of sure. it. Like the psychologist said early, there's some kids who are doing fairly well, fairly well. <laughs> but there's other kids uh, that have more damage that are just really struggling. And then they move on into the, the, uh, the behaviors that get them into trouble. The, in, the, in the FASD world, um, it's thought that they really, um, an FAS child doesn't get emancipated from adult care until they're about 35 years old. So when they're young, they're in, they're in schools and with parents. When they hit you know, 14, 15 years old, maybe they're, you know, they, their parent has to move them into a foster placement because they can't manage it, whatever, and the school's still managing them until they go into alternative schools or what have you. When they hit 18, then those types of protections are gone, and they then end up in the, the adult care that's helping them is either in judicial system where they're, man, they're you know, um, uh, adjudicated into some sort of a um, court system or they're in social services and they're being cared by and these are things that are costing us massive amounts of money because these are the brains that are that are are in those problems or having those problems and and that and because their emotional age is either stunted or, or literally arrested you know some of them just don't man move past a certain emotional age their biological age hasn't changed. So they're getting, their body is getting the hormones of a normal adolescent kid and a normal adult. And, and of course, if they can't emotionally and, and, and uh, intellectually handle all those urges, they're getting themselves into trouble. And that's where you see a lot of the perpetrating that are happen that's happening with the um, kids um, because they're emotional, they, they just can't manage the biological urges of the body. So we should say that there is uh, help developing. I know there are a number of area uh, hospitals that mm -hmm. are putting staff on to help recognize this. Exactly. And there's a, a state organization, I forget the name, I know you know the name, that's doing billboards now. Right. Minnesota Organization of Fetal Alcohol Syndrome. And that was started by Susan Carlson, who was the wife of former Governor Arnie Carlson. And that's been a very effective um, program. Minnesota is one of the most effective uh, branches out of the National Organization of Fetal Alcohol Syndrome. In fact, the, the most effective one in the nation. So this disorder can lead to violence, yes. which is what your book is about, right. The Fatal right. Link. Tell us about that. Tell us what you're doing here. Well, um, let, me, let me just give you a little example of a, some research that is in the book. Um, I went to the Crow Wing County Jail, and I asked Jerry Negan if I could um, just do a survey of the um, inmates because I was just curious to see if I could get, if my theory of, of prenatal exposure would be, um, well, I could find out if there, there was a link. So I did a survey in there and what I found was that 94% of the inmates in that one week that I did that survey, 94% of the inmate, inmates had mothers who drank alcohol. Do you know how many you're talking roughly? How many inmates were there? Uh, there was about 140 inmates in there at that time. 90 some percent, 94 percent. And, and those inmates came from here, from other counties, and one inmate that actually did an interview with me, five, five of them um, offered to do an interview. They had no idea what I was gonna interview them on. And all five of them reported that their mothers were heavy drinkers. I could see, f um, I could see facial manifestations of prenatal exposure to alcohol on three of the five faces. And of those five people, we talked about their siblings, their children, their significant others, or their wives, husbands, we identified 16 other people amongst those five that had heavy prenatal exposure to alcohol. And there was a litany of, of behaviors that had caused them to be put into jail, including sexual um, uh, perpet uh, perpetrators, um, uh, over two, um, and meth methamphetamine users, that was uh, the big one. And then one was just uh, um, repeat um, DWIs that was in there. You know, you think about it, the cost from childhood to adulthood for dealing with this problem is astronomical, isn't it, to our society? It, and just in dollars, yeah. not to mention the emotional costs. Oh, it, it, it is. And, and you see a lot of that emotional cost with the adoptive parents because they're talking about it and the emotional cost that they have and their families have. But um, the physical problems that um, children that are far over on the spectrum have cost us tremendously. There's a woman in Isanti, Minnesota, a psychologist who's adopted four children. 
in the year 2006 alone, the medical cost for those four children was $1 million. That's only one year for those four kids. So if you, you know, there's a lot of um, problems that come with premature birth, heart problems, uh, all, all sorts of physical problems that kids, and then you have to um, mitigate those problems with surgeries and what have you that cost a lot of money. I had one kid in one of my schools that had had his second heart surgery by the time he was in third grade. Wow. Um, and that dad told me that, that um, he did everyone in his family, wife, mother, him, everyone in his family were prenatally exposed to yeah. alcohol. And his girlfriend was sitting right next to him and after we talked, he turned to his girlfriend and they, she was holding a baby and he, he said, um, thank you so much for not drinking all the times I tried to get you to drink and you didn't drink. I was the first person in his life that told him. That's just a year ago. And uh, he said it was, that baby was the first baby in his family that it broke was the born, chain. That broke the chain. So back okay. to your book. Well, one night I was sitting watching TV. It was the, it was, there was a huge traumatic event that happened in Minnesota, and this picture changed my life. I saw this picture on the television. This, this picture, when I saw it, I decided that I needed to do some research. I started looking. That is a picture, the fourth grade picture, of Jeff Weiss from Red Lake, the day of the Red Lake school shooting. Now, bear in mind, I'd spent 18 years working on reservations. I'd worked on a reservation up at, on Leech Lake, which was very close to Red Lake. I had colleagues who were working in Red Lake. But I'm also from Grand Rapids, Minnesota. And in 1974, there was an, I, I got an award, a Forrest L. Wiley Good Citizenship Award. And that, that award was, um, I didn't realize how much that award meant to me until I started doing my research. Forrest L. Wiley was the first school administrator shot in the first shooting, first school shooting in the nation in Grand Rapids, Minnesota in 1966. I was in fifth grade the day it happened. I can clearly remember the day. When I saw the Jeff Weiss picture, I then started thinking. I could see physical manifestations in that fourth grade picture of Jeff Weiss that indicated that he was heavily prenatally exposed to alcohol. And the news reports were coming out that his mother was a severe alcoholic. Now, let me just make a point. Of the 69 school shooters that I studied, two of those 69 school shooters, the news media came out right away saying the mother was an alcoholic. Both of them were Native American mothers. I found a very big bias in the media because they identified the, the Native American mothers as alcoholic, but they did not look at the, other, the mothers in the other school shootings. Now, that's, that's what I want to talk about. It's not a Native American thing. I went back to my hometown in Grand Rapids, and I talked to the police officer, Harvey Darlene. Harvey Darlene was a police officer who um, walked across the school grounds when David Black came, came across the yard and Harvey Darlene, a young officer who was a bus driver at the time, he, he was dressed in his uniform, he drove the bus up, the, they stopped him, he jumped out, he didn't have a gun with him. Um, a highway patrolman who was a block or so away gave him a pistol and Harvey ran across and he confronted the school shooter. And uh, the school shooter, David Black, had just shot two people. He had shot the student that was tormenting him, and he had shot, and he had shot Forrest L. Wiley, who died eight days later. The reason I mention Harvey Darlene is because when I started doing the research on, on the school shooter in Grand Rapids, Harvey Darlene said, and I knew Harvey from years, years and years ago. Harvey was the first guy who struck me out in slow pitch softball, and, I, and he still reminds me of that today. But Harvey said, Jody, you're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you. I said, what's that, Harvey? He said, I have what you're talking about. And then he went to tell me his story. He was adopted when he was young. He had a twin brother. He had a family. All of his family was adopted out. Harvey's my mother was a very heavy alcoholic. Harvey struggled with his academics all through school. He says, I can show you my report card. And he still struggles to this day with reading and writing. And his wife and I talked about it. And, and Harvey said, I want to tell people, I have struggled with this all my life. 
but it was so unique when I started doing this research, finding a school shooter and a police officer that had some of the same issues, mm. but they had a different path in their life that they took, and they had adults around them that helped them in different paths. Harvey had adoptive families, and, and he got into the Army, and he had uh, football. He was, a, he was a superb athlete. David Black, on the other hand, was not. He was not a superb athlete. He had all kinds of problems. When, when I found out about, out about David Black, I talked to his, his uh, second cousin, and she told me about his behaviors, but she said there was no alcohol at all in the family. And I talk, talked to her for about an hour that night, and I just kept asking her, are you sure there's no alcohol? And she said, no, nope, there's no alcohol. But then she said at the end of the conversation, I'm going to call my mom, who was the first cousin of the mother, and they were very, very close, and, and I'll ask her. And the next morning, I, I got, got up and on my email, she said, I stand corrected. She drank so heavily, she lost her first child. And then she drank through David Black and her other child. So now I had Jeff Weiss, um, mother of severe alcoholic. David Black, confirmation that his mother had drank very heavily. So then I started doing more research. I looked at a shooting in, in uh, Wisconsin, and I found out about this in Tomo, Wisconsin. Mr. Mogensen was, was um, killed in 1969. I found out about it because his daughters had um, put a Martin Mogensen um, education lecture at the UW Eau Claire. And uh, so I started doing research in that one, and I talked to his daughters, spent a lot of time you know, communicating with his daughters. And they kept <coughs> urging me to find the true story of that shooter. I finally talked to an uncle of the shooter who was at the wedding when the shooter's mother was married, pregnant with the shooter, drunk at the wedding. He continued to, um, the uncle continued to drink through for until the dad died, drank with that family. So he was able to confirm to me that it was heavy drinking in that family, heavy prenatal exposure to alcohol. And that shooter in 1969 had the academic, social uh, behaviors of heavy prenatal exposure to alcohol. He brought a gun into the school um, and shot the principal. So then I had three. There were six school shooters in Minnesota and Wisconsin. While I was doing my research, um, I, I looked at um, a shooting in Wauwatosa, um, Wisconsin, I couldn't find information on the mother. The shooter was 21 years old, but he clearly fits the profile. But I just couldn't find enough information. Uh, and uh, then Minnesota had another shooter, um, McLaughlin, in uh, Cold Spring, Macquarie. And this uh, young man, 14 years old, walked into the school and killed two boys in the school. I've talked directly to the mother. The mother told me, and I'd found evidence that the mother had been a binge drinker uh, in her early childhood years. And when I asked her about it, she said, yes, I was a binge drinker, but I didn't drink like that during the pregnancy. Um, then there was the, um, the Red Lake school shooting. And I have talked to Joanne Weiss. She's the first school shooter in the nation that I've talked to. And she sat down with me, and she said she, said she was a heavy drinker. She started drinking in her teenage years. Um, she had Jeff when she was a teenager. She said, my drinking screwed up his brain, didn't it? And um, she... Um, and when, I, when the Jeff Weiss, uh, the picture that I saw of Jeff Weiss, I could see in his eyes, the, in the, the form, formation of his eyes, that he had had um, heavy prenatal exposure to alcohol. So while I was doing my research, there was a shooting in Casanova, Wisconsin. Um, Eric Hainstock. Eric Hainstock, um, his mother was lost rights, parental rights to him when, she was, when he was very, very young. And the judge in the court records stated that she had heavy alcohol use, el uh, he heavy alcohol abuse. And, and his, uh, looking at his picture when he's 14, 15 years old, there's some manifestations that I can see, but I, w I haven't been able to see real young pictures of him. I was just going to say that uh, the Weiss uh, mother has offered to help you, I believe, and yeah. she's been actually a non-drinker for, I think you for said, ten like years, 10 years now. Yeah, she showed me her medallion. She's uh, been sober for 10 years. And we just have about three minutes left, but you did do a little research into the Columbine shooting, too, didn't you? Yes, I it's did. It's not part of your book. It, oh, it is. Oh, it yes, is part of your yes, book. Yes, I do okay. have it in my book. Um, a researcher in Germany looked at physical manifestations in FAS, and one of, one of the physical manifesta manifestations in fetal alcohol syndrome is 37% uh, have either a pigeon chest or a concave chest. And 
when you, when I, I've got a probability tool that I look at the behaviors of mothers to see if they have high risk factors. Er, um, Eric, um, uh, the, one of the shooters, his name just left. Holder. Uh, um, uh, I, I put Eric Hainstock, but he's the, he's the Casanova one. Um, but one of the shooter's mothers was a wife of an Air Force cap, a captain. And, um, and I've talked to somebody who was another um, Air Force wife who was on two Air Force bases with them and very close friends of the family. When she found out I was doing the research, she called me. She told me that she could not confirm that um, Eric's mother drank during the pregnant, pregnancy because her own husband was alcoholic, so they never put themselves into a situation where there's drinking. But she was, she said, um, she did not deny that the mother was drinking. But um, he had a physical manifestation that's really not well known. He had a concave chest, so he I, he had physical or he had social behaviors that fit prenatal exposure to alcohol, and he had a physical characteristic that is linked to prenatal exposure to alcohol. Fascinating. It's fascinating information. And again, we need to point out that this is the extreme of the spectrum. This oh, isn't what all people who right. have fetal alcohol uh, disorder have, right. but right. this is the extreme. And it's absolutely uh, unbelievable information that you're digging up here. Thank How you. do people get your book? Um, they can contact um, healthybrainsforchildren.org, www.healthybrainsforchildren.org. Contact me and I can send them a book, or they can go on Amazon.com and get the book there. And I know you're also available for speaking engagements. Yes, if the yeah. people want to get a hold of you, they can go to that website. That's correct. Also, Jody, thanks for Ray, spending thank the last uh, two programs with us talking about a topic that we think is just very, very important, and we hope that we've enlightened and informed our viewers on this particular topic. Now, do you have uh, what's what's your next big venture with this? Well. Healthy Brains for Children is now working, actually the Brainerd uh, Morning Rotary and the Noon Rotary are working to put together a project here in the Brainerd Lakes area okay. and, and work with, uh, you know, and, and try to help everybody who's working on this and uh, support everybody All who's right. trying to stop this. Great. Thanks a lot. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time.